Your Excellencies, uh, dear friends, um, I am Zaid Rand Al Hussein, the President of the International Peace Institute, and on, on behalf of all my colleagues, I welcome you most warmly to our office, and I extend uh, our appreciation to the online audience who are with us today. We're delighted to be joining the United States, Sweden, and Cypri in co-hosting this event, and we are privileged to have here with us both uh, Secretary Kerry, uh, the US uh, Special Envoy, and Foreign Minister Lind of Sweden, uh, as well as Dan Smith, the President of CIPRI, um, and we are, are grateful for their support. The connections between climate and security are complex and not easy to discern Certainly when it comes to the security of a person or even a nation, uh, the links are rather obvious. They are less so when we view climate and international peace and security together, especially when the latter is understood in its traditional sense. While we believe almost by intuition that a, con a connection in that context, the context of international peace and security must be intimate. I mean, how could it not be? If millions of people move, surely you have chaos. A review or any review of contemporary uh, human history will point to something that suggests we may be fooling ourselves, that our conclusion in this regard is perhaps more conjecture. Why? Well, while it is true, manifestly true, that violence brought on by repeated droughts and other factors uh, has revealed itself repeatedly in the Sahel, that violence is often on a smaller scale than is commonly perceived. And historically, throughout the world, millions have moved from their homes, their villages, their towns, and even countries, driven out by conflict and by other causes, in ways that affect the ethnic and religious balances of, com of communities across borders, and yet there is no violence. We have to be able to explain that too. With the exception of the movement of 10 to 20 million people throughout the Punjab and between India and the newly created state of Pakistan shortly after India and Pakistan gained their independence 75 years ago, and where the violence was frightful, there are precious few other examples in recent history on a similar scale. So we must understand what happened in that particular case. Simmering communal ten tensions and, sudden, and the sudden revelation of the partition map must be a core part of it. But is that all? And then how does that connection between climate and security in the traditional sense actually work. Once we understand that precise mechanism, it would become easier for us to fit our understanding of it, to integrate it into climate adaptation plans. We therefore look forward to the discussion which will now be held with this highly distinguished group of panelists and which will be moderated by our good friend, CIPRI President Dan Smith. And once again, a warm welcome to you all. So thank you very much, Said. And first of all, let me uh, thank IPI on behalf of uh, CIPRI for letting us join in in this way and thank our two also co-hosts, the governments of the US and of Sweden for setting this up. Welcome to everybody here and uh, welcome to the online audience as well. Um, as you know, I am sure, we have a tremendous panel to be discussing this issue of advancing climate security in the year of implementation. Um, the panelists, uh, uh, John Kerry, who I'm sure needs no introduction, but I will mention that, of course, he is the special presidential envoy for climate of the USA at the moment, um, a well-known and um, high-profile uh, political career. Uh, we're also joined by Anne Linda, who is the Foreign Minister of Sweden, though I kind of share with you for a moment and the regret that you will not be presumably continuing for too terribly long uh, in that position after the last elections. We are joined also with by Amina Shona, who is the Minister of Environment for the Maldives, 
and by Mr. Christian Guillermet Fernandez, who is the uh, Vice Foreign Minister for Multilateral Affairs of Costa Rica. And along to my left at the far end is Rosemary de Carlo, the Under Secretary General uh, for Political and Peacebuilding Affairs. Mm -hmm. And next to her, Nizreen El Saim from the Sudan Youth for Climate Change Movement, who is also uh, Chair of the UN Secretary General's Youth Advisory Group. And I introduced Nizreen to you last because I'm going to ask her to speak first. Um, let me just say that the relationship between climate change and insecurity may have been difficult to be tracing over uh, recent years, maybe was complex to understand 15 to 20 years ago, perhaps 10 years ago. But the sad thing is that as the years go by, it becomes clearer and clearer. The natural foundations on which communities and societies stand, which are the basis of our existence and of our common life, that natural platform is being weakened. And as that happens, it is only to be expected that there will be various kinds of upheavals because of the change and the threat to livelihood security and to food security and to general well-being. And some of those upheavals will be reasonably well handled by institutions and governments, and some not. That's why there are different outcomes along the way. And those which aren't, sometimes they will either lead to or they will exacerbate violent conflict. We've developed a simple way of trying to understand this, which is simply to say that nature does not tell you the whole story about any conflict. But increasingly, if you leave nature out of the picture, you are not telling the whole story. And therefore policy, which is trying to address problems of conflict and of building peace, if it is not addressing nature, is also not the whole story and will not be the whole solution. Honestly, some of this, I think, is not rocket science. You have this enormous impact upon people and their living conditions, and it leads to problems at the local level. In addition, the connection is further because conflicts in communities, in countries, in regions, make it harder to cooperate and work together to adapt to the impact of climate change. So conflict makes climate change policy and climate action more difficult. And it does this visibly at the global level as well. There is a geopolitical connection as well between insecurity and climate change. So with those connections there, a big part of the question is, what are we going to do about it? And I hope that we will be moving more and more into that as the conversation goes on. I want to open now by asking uh, Nisreen. One of the striking things about the movement for change in Sudan in the last few years has been that you have prioritized climate change as an issue. And I guess that the first thing to ask you is why? What is the impact for ordinary people? How is it affecting their well-being and security? And how is the movement for change in Sudan trying to address that? Um, thank you very much, uh, Dan, and um, welcome, everyone. I'm very glad to be here with you today. Well, I am uh, happy and sad at the same time that you asked me this question. And um, because uh, our civil movement is having some sort of a backwards, <laughs> um, yet, as I mentioned um, in my speech at COP26, that I have no doubt that both movements, whether it's climate change or the civil movement in Sudan will, will success and succeed at the end. The problem and the question is when, and uh, the other question is at what cost? Um, well, one of the things that makes the topics that we're working on very sensitive, um, and I mean by topics, climate change, peace and security, is that it's very much depending on the time. Um, as as you mentioned, it's been a while since we, we have this agenda item on the table, yet uh, we still don't have rapid steps to actually tackle this movement. Um, it's, it's a bit funny because why I started to do climate change is because I remember I was a kid, I think I was six or seven years old, when, um, when I was hearing about the United Nations nuclear weapon, at that time it was uh, Kofi Annan, um, may his soul rest in peace, um, as the um, 
Secretary General and Condoleezza Rice was the Minister of Foreign Affairs of, 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 uh, of United States. And I was hearing my father and my mother talking intensively and she, God help her <laughs> and bless her. She was trying so much to explain to me. Uh, and it's sad to see that even after all of this time, we are still talking about the same topic without having an actual uh, steps to tackle it. Um, in, in, in 20, uh, no, it's in 2007, um, uh, the previous um, Secretary General, Mr. Ban Ki-moon, said that the war in Darfur is the first climate change-based conflict um, we are actually witnessing. And this was the launch where the Security Council started to having uh, briefing sessions, resolutions linking together climate change and peace and security. I had the, the honor to brief the Security Council three times until now. And I want to ask Erland because I see some of their um, uh, representation here in the room for championing uh, the youth climate change, peace and security agenda. And I um, very much tackle on their continuous support. Also, the Dominican Republic and other countries also leading this agenda item in the Security Council. Why now we are bringing this from the Security Council to the climate change sphere and sector is because um, the, the Security Council is dealing with the threats to this, uh, the human security, yet is not dealing with the technical part of it. And as a technical person, you said it's not a rocket science, and it's funny because I'm a physicist, and I, I consider sometimes rocket science easier than uh, humanitarian and um, um, social sciences, um, is because the technical part, how climate change is causing problems in peace and security. Well, now we have a new element, which is buying fuel and gas actually fuels and finance wars like what we are seeing in ukraine for example and this is a new concept that we didn't we didn't use to talk about we used to talk about how directly climate change imposed conflicts conflicts over natural resources migrations due to droughts floods etc that makes conflict because of the host community because of the embedding resources anyway but every day um, and this is very sad and unfortunate every day a new element to the issue of climate peace and security is added to the table Yet, I don't think all of us, UN, EU, AU, are like all of the multilateral uh, are dealing and tackling climate change and peace and security um, seriously enough. I will, uh, I will just um, finish this and give the space to others by um, uh, a small uh, appeal. Um, well, when the IPCC started, we still had climate denials. I'll, we still have them but they are little less than we had before. Why? Because science, and we have more people believing in science. And I also believe in science. That's why I'm saying that investing in science to actually tackle climate change, peace and security issues is the not the only way, but the best and fastest way. We need to understand and analyze how uh, climate change is actually in influencing peace and security, how to, for, to stop that, and also how to invest in building the capacities of the local people to stop uh, conflicts before happening. I always say that climate activists, by building the resilience of the communities, by making their um, people and rural areas more adaptable to climate change, are not peace builders, because peace builders build peace after the conflict, but actually they are conflict preventers. And we all say prevention is better than cure. It costs less souls, it costs less money, resources, and of course, it spares a lot of time. So join the hands with the uh, climate activists in your countries, in your regions, and also in around the world to actually prevent conflict from happening instead of building the peace after the conflict. Thank you. Nizreen, thank you. Thank you so much. And especially for two clear takeaways, invest in science and invest in resilience and prevention. And I love that finish of joining the hands, because I think that it's not just dividing subjects into intellectual silos, but it's dividing different people and different special specialities from each other is part of our part of our problem. And Sweden, um, especially under your leadership, has championed the importance of recognizing the linkages that we're talking about today between climate change and insecurity. And it made possible the launching of the climate security mechanism in the UN. And of course, when you were chairing the US, uh, the OSCE led the way to getting the linkages recognized there as well. So you've been working with this agenda for a time. You've seen it develop. How would you like to see it develop now? 
well, uh, thank you very much. And uh, thank you, Nisreen, for, for making such a strong opening statement. Well, uh, let me say that when we campaigned for the Security Council, uh, we uh, had the opportunity to listen and, and to listen carefully to many voices. And we, we heard firsthand from small island states how the rising sea levels uh, would threaten the very existence uh, and also we learned from people, not least in, in Africa, uh, how uh, heat and drought and so made it easier for violent extremist group uh, to uh, recruit uh, people. So um, I am happy that we made some progress during our time in the Security Council 17 to 18. We initiated what is called the climate security mechanism. And that has already shown its value because it's sharing best practice and it's um, sending advices to UN mission. Uh, but we would love for more countries to step in uh, because this mission, um, this mechanism, I'm sorry, needs to be scaled up. And uh, I think it's uh, encouraging to see that UN agencies um, are taking climate and security seriously. And, and I guess all of us heard the Secretary General this morning who spent quite a long time in his speech uh, talking about these uh, issues. We have a group of friends of uh, climate and security. It's more than 50 members, could be many more. We have 130 countries who has co-sponsored the Security Council uh, resolution on climate and security. Uh, that sent a very strong message that it actually were so many countries that signed up, uh, but it's a disgrace that it was vetoed. Happened too many, too many times nowadays. Uh, and um, uh, when I was chairperson, um, and uh, I and Sweden was chairperson of OSE, I traveled all over Eastern uh, Europe and Central Asia last year. And uh, I was struck by how central the issue of water is to many uh, conflict. For example, I had to take the telephone and, 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 uh, and help to calm down the situation between Kyrgyzstan and Tajikistan. Now it happened again. And one of the main reasons is the, the conflict over water. Uh, and even in, in um, uh, and hundreds of deaths this, this year too. Um, and even an issue like uh, between Azerbaijan mm. and, and Armenia, uh, they, there also is a, a, a part that has to do with, uh, with water. <laughs> We took a major step uh, at the ministerial uh, in, in Stockholm in uh, December last year and got the mandate for OSE to finally uh, probably, pro uh, properly be able to work uh, with climate change as a key factor for peace and stability. And in the same way now African Union is taking those kind of steps. But of course, uh, now Russian aggression against uh, Ukraine has caused um, a global energy crisis, a global food crisis. Millions are facing hunger. Um, the, there will be a, a hard winter. Uh, it will be cold, uh, not at least for Europeans. Um, but we must not forget that uh, the um, uh, climate change is, is um, uh, causing harvest to fail uh, in Sahel, in Somalia, uh, and droughts have caused uh, drops in hydroelectric power production in Europe. So all this uh, is um, creating a, a perfect neg negative storm, I would say. Uh, so there is a real risk um, that climate change clearly makes uh, security uh, risk much worse, and uh, we are all affected by this. Um, and just uh, finally, let's be honest, it's, uh, um, we go into unknown territory, this issue of climate and security, we haven't worked with that long. You have done you know, this wonderful report from, from CIPRI, and you helped us in arguing the case in OSE to show that there was 22 hotspots in the yeah. whole OSE area of 57 countries where actually climate issues could be a cause of, of um, a conflict. But we need better data on what is going on. We need uh, more financing. Uh, we need to focus on the more vulnerable, which is women and, and, and children. 
uh, your little child. <laughs> <we're hosting. laughs> and uh, um, you and Nick need to make a difference on the ground in, in Sahel and the Horn of Africa and many other places. And thank you, thank you so much, and especially thank you for um, mentioning this report. I am completely shameless in advertising <laughs> Environment of Peace. If the foreign minister wishes to mention a report that we produced, I'm happy to advertise it. And thank you also for the emphasis on uh, vulnerability uh, and on um, more support also for the, for the uh, climate security mechanism. Uh, now over to, to John Kerry, and the, the Biden administration has been prioritizing the risks that climate crisis poses to security. So how is the US uh, addressing this, this nexus of different issues? And what do you think is needed to spur implementation along? We've put the title or included in the title, the idea of the year of impl implementation. How do we get that moving? Well, Dan, thank you. Um, first of all, uh, great to be here. Ms. Green, thank you for your opening and, and thank you for being a co-host and also a co-conspirator for these years. Uh, I appreciate it very, very much. Uh, and Zaid, thank you. It's great to see you again, and thanks for hosting us. Um, in a sense, my presence here with the title that I have is a statement about the Biden administration's approach to the challenge of, of climate crisis, i.e., uh, I am a special envoy on climate change, but I sit on the National Security Council and I have the right personally, as I have done on two occasions, to call National Security Council meetings uh, where we have all hands on deck to evaluate this challenge. Um, the challenge is frankly not new uh, to us because even back in George H.W. Bush days and, and uh, thereafter, uh, our military, the Pentagon, had an office, which obviously Donald Trump closed, but other than that, um, it was there and it was to focus on climate, the climate nexus to security. And I remember back in the days of the 90s when uh, several generals uh, articulated publicly the degree to which climate and the crisis growing with it is a threat multiplier. You've all heard that term, I'm sure, with respect to climate. So now those threats are multiplying uh, rapidly. Mother Nature is sending us unprecedented messages about uh, her displeasure with our activities and, and the warning signals could not be more clear. Uh, it is common sense, but it nevertheless, you know, I agree, it's, it's not rocket science, it's pretty lineal uh, and, and lineal vertical and horizontal in terms of the connections here that are a threat to us. Uh, books have been written, I think one of them may have been entitled Water Wars. Uh, there have been books written for some period of time defining uh, how conflict uh, as a result of the absence of water or land that is encroached on or drought and, and uh, you know, in, in inhospitable conditions for growing crops and feeding people, uh, how that gets in the way of building community and indeed peace, ultimately. Make no mistake. Resolving the climate crisis is integrally related to the, uh, to the creation of peace, which is much more than the absence of war. And so you really have to uh, think about the conditions that are necessary for societies to flourish and for human beings to be able to uh, uh, look to their better nature rather than feel so frightened and so compressed in their choices that they feel like they have no other choice but then to resort to the use of force or to uh, conflict as a means of resolving their crisis. We are looking at the potential of the entire food production capacity of Africa to implode. And if anybody thinks that Europe's politics were changed by 
refugees coming out of Syria when we were coping with that particular challenge and going through Turkey and then, you know, certain someone would turn the dial up or turn it down and people would be pushed into Europe. Uh, and it had a profound impact in changing the politics of Europe. Just ask anybody in Germany or in France or in other places. So um, it is the great disruptor. And disruption in international affairs, when you already face uh, enough of the challenges that we face, is not a welcome friend. Uh, and that's where we are. That's what we're witnessing now. Uh, the fact is that today, as we sit here in a warm New York, 15 million people a year are dying from the quality or lack of quality of air around the planet. Five million people are dying every year from extreme heat. And as that magnifies, as we, I mean, you look at rivers that are now flowing at record low levels, boats from World War II suddenly appearing in the rivers, Roman ruins appearing where nobody knew they were, walk across the Rhine in a couple of places. Uh, you look at the Yangtze River, the Yellow River, the Mekong and so forth. Uh, the Himalayas are changing radically, and we see what happened in Pakistan. Um, so hopefully, uh, we don't have to fight to describe the crisis. But we do have to fight. And, and as we were walking in, Anne mentioned to me sort of the climate denier situation with respect to Sweden and elsewhere. So we do have to fight not with respect to the establishment of the facts, but to get a whole group of people who are in denial about life itself to begin to embrace truth again. And that is a big challenge, folks. We, we, we used to have referees who could help us decide what the truth was. But many of those referees have been stripped away by politics of ignorance and of assault. And, uh, and, and, and we're living in a very dangerous time as a result of that, obviously. And, and then, of course, compounded by Ukraine and, and, and so forth. So we've conducted the first ever national intelligence estimate on climate change, the Department of Defense climate risk analysis. And uh, that reinforces the president's commitment to building out an early warning system to the Global Shield program, uh, to any number of uh, development initiatives that will have an impact on this. We just committed $1.6 million, not the biggest amount in the world, but to the complex risk analysis effort, the craft D. It's a UN multi-known arm. Many of you are familiar with it here. Uh, and, and we are also uh, you know, fixated on trying to augment their ability to gather data sufficiently to give us the warning about things to come. And uh, I just came back from Senegal in Nigeria, and I'll talk about that maybe uh, you know, in the next round. But I'll just say that uh, 17 of the world's 20 most climate-threatened nations are in Africa. And Africa as a whole, as a continent, provides around 3% of all the emissions of the planet. 48 sub-Saharan African states account for 0.55% of emissions. 20 nations, and we're one of them, basically the G20, not quite exactly, represent 80% of all emissions. You wanna solve the climate crisis? Get those 20 nations to start behaving properly. Now, 65% of them in Glasgow, embraced a legitimate 1.5 degree track. But we got a bunch of other countries that didn't do that. And frankly, you know, claiming that you haven't had an historical amount of time to be able to pollute the atmosphere is not exactly the best theory of uniting the world to deal with this challenge. So we have our work cut out for us, obviously. And uh, uh, what disturbs me the most is, uh, and I'm, you know, I don't, I don't think I'm jaded, and I don't think I'm growing cynical, but I am getting more and more realistic, and uh, telling it like it is. And I'll tell you, if we don't summon these major economies to the table to put real dollars on the table, this is all a joke, or I mean, not a bad joke. This is all uh, an empty 
process, worse than Sisyphus pushing the rock up the mountain. Uh, and, and shame on us if that's where we allow it to go because we have to summon real dollars to the table. That's the challenge for Sharm El Sheikh. That's the challenge in the days ahead. And, and I'm not talking about you know, throwaway money. I'm talking about uh, development. That's what Africa needs. That's what a lot of countries need, but develop the right way. And those are the things that we need to argue about. Every bit of security of every nation on the planet is totally dependent on how we resolve this crisis. And it is more immediate, folks, than the nuclear threat, more immediate than the cyber threat, which is real. All these other things we need to be controlling. I don't know how much work you see being done on them, but I don't personally feel that we're sort of pushing the curve on those items. But this, you know, this is, uh, wait till you have millions, tens of millions of people knocking on the door saying, we can't live here anymore, can't survive. You have trees, you have water. You know, we want to share in that. Think about what the response to that will be. So we, this is a very appropriate topic and glad to wrestle with it. John, thank you. Thank you so much. A really powerful statement and with a number of things in there that are highly practical. But I think I'm gonna just focus the thought on the money on the table. I mean, it, it, it has to happen. Now, Amina, turning to you, the Maldives face an existential threat. So I guess the question to you following on listening to John is, okay, so what can you in the Maldives do, but what do you, assistance do you need in order to be meeting the needs of your people? Thank you, and it's a pleasure to be here. We, I think most people here might know the Maldives as a honeymoon destination. It's one of the most beautiful countries on the planet. But um, I think um, some of us also know about how vulnerable the Maldives is. We are about 1,200 islands. Most of the islands are just about a meter above sea level. We have observed sea level rise of about three, three to four millimeters every year. So climate change is an existential threat for us. Um, the difference between 1.5 and two degrees really is a death sentence for us. And um, we don't have a higher ground. But I think people also don't know about the political history of our country. We are a country that is so challenged by climate change, but we are also an emerging democracy. And Zaid is, is a friend of ours for, for a very long time. Uh, we had our first multi-party democratic elections in 2008. Since then, we've had a coup, and we are now back um, after democratic elections in government. We are also challenged by increasing um, radical Islam in the Maldives. Um, so all of these are very challenging development issues. Over the past um, three decades, what has lifted us from poverty is um, tourism and fisheries industry. Both are extremely dependent on the health of our oceans and on how we are able to address the issue of climate change. Uh, we are doing what we can in the Maldives. We have a target to reach net zero by 2030. We have banned single use plastics in the Maldives. We are developing marine spatial plants to protect at least 20% of our oceans. We're the seventh largest reef system and we have protected 13% of the reef area. We don't want to only be victims of climate change. We want to take the leadership and show it to the world that if countries like the Maldives can do it, the rest of the world can do it as well. Um, so reflecting on the democratic history, the challenges that um, climate change poses on our development, I think what really, um, my fear really is that we may slide back to a developing country um, in the next couple of decades if we fail to address um, the issue of climate finance and the resources that countries like the Maldives have. Today, we are a higher middle income country, but 
the amount of resources that we have to spend from our local domestic finances on adaptation, on mitigation, is a big chunk of our budget. That means we are having to reallocate budgets that would otherwise go into education, into health, into fighting ra radical Islam, and um, to continue to consolidate democracy and reform our institutions are going into um, disaster risk management and um, compensation for people who are affected by increased um, erosion, um, um, flooding and other storm events. We have run out of fresh water on every single island in the Maldives. The government is spending from our own resources to implement um, desalination plants on every island, which is very expensive again. Our, cor our coral reefs were affected by the last bleaching. 75% of our reefs were bleached. We're talking about a country that is dependent so much on fisheries. All our fish are caught one by one and we have the most sustainable fisheries in the world. And, um, and yet our sustainability efforts are also again penalized when um, our largest markets are taxing our tuna because we are a higher middle income country. So essentially the money, the revenue that we are generating from blue economy are being penalized. We are not having, we don't have access to climate finance. We have all these development challenges could destabilize a country in the middle of the Indian ocean. And I think that's, so important to continue to keep peace and stability in the Indian Ocean to ensure that we, we don't have diverging interests um, and that could possibly affect the peace and stability in the Indian Ocean is critical. So um, that's what I have um, for the moment. And I think democracies are really important to continue to have um, peace and stability. And um, that's why small island nations like the Maldives need more support. We're not asking for a free ride on this. We are reforming our revenue sources and we are spending from our budget. We just need additional support to help us address the challenges that we, we face, new and emerging challenges that we face due to climate impacts. Thank you. Thank you so much, Amina. That's very clear. And I think that along with everything else that is emerging, two big things which are coming out from almost every one of the contributions so far is the need to understand and assess the risks and the need to rethink and get financing right. So I, I now want to turn to Christian Guillermet Fernandez from, the, um, uh, from, from Costa Rica. And your region too sees a heavy impact uh, of climate change. So in a nutshell, what are, what are the problems you see, the, fear, the fears that you have, and what are your hopes about the linkages between climate action and peace? Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, uh, moderator, and thank you very much for the invitation. I'm very pleased to be at the International Peace Institute the day before that we we're going to celebrate the International Day of Peace tomorrow. And if you allow me, this is something that we really need now because all the challenges that the global elite are facing is increased by the crisis and the fact that we are so polarized and we need a, a very effective multilateralism to, to, to really face uh, the challenges that we are talking about. Costa Rica is, is deeply uh, concerned about the potential that has the, 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 the conflict for, by climate change and the additional burden that is put in, in uh, place in our communities and at the, at the more poor and vulnerable groups. And this is uh, clear for us. In our communities, we are having sustainable infrastructure, for instance, is, is crucial, is fundamental. It is because in the end, what the country uh, is most endeavored for, for to, to um, reach a uh, uh, restart of the economy, but also because uh, uh, all the infrastructure is destroyed every year by the climate, the rains, the hurricanes, et cetera, et cetera. But beyond the, the effects in, in Costa Rica, we strongly believe that the climate change and the wider environmental crisis contribute to the overall international insecurity and impacts 
unfortunately expand beyond borders and in particular in my region in Central America, one of the most vulnerable regions also in the world. And, and for example, what we notice from, from our side, we, we are sure that the major environmental disturbances often generates social and political uh, instability, uh, which in resolve uh, can escalate into violence. And this is very clear in our region now with all the phenomena of the migration coming from the south, moving through Panama, Costa Rica, and they are walking and they are walking and the, most of those people are, are leaving their countries due to climate change. The, also because the climate change is affecting the economy. The agricultural sector is affected um, and, and, and then people without uh, well-being is people that can move to the violence, to criminality. Our region is also the region of, with uh, organized crime. They have the means, you know, all the narco traffics also moving from the south to the north. And this is also a, a clear situation when you have poor and you don't have opportunities, then you choose the opportunities that all the, the, the criminal organized crime is given to us. But the, 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 the negative effects of loss of housing, lack of access to basic life necessities are also something that is increasing this social violence that is produced by the climate change. For Costa Rica, we recognize, and here is, is something that we wanted to make it very clear, that the, the environmental integrity and peace are inextricably linked. They are really both. And, and we think that the, the addressing environmental and security issues together give us the opportunity to ensure that the measures that we can take are aimed at solving one problem and don't make the other worse. And this is, I think that this is, must be very clear. And because nature and peace are interlinked, damage one, damage the other. And there is a clear consequences of, of that. And, uh, and protect one and in, enhance also the other. And um, I remember, uh, you know, 35 years ago, your president, Mrs. Ganmoon, start his statement at the General Assembly saying, I'm not coming here to talk about international political issues. I'm coming here to talk about the this, this, the this, uh, see the 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 yes exactly no 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 the the disappearance of a nation he says that clearly and and uh, uh, twenty years later the general assembly accept to have climate change as a as a point of agenda and now thirty five years you yeah. still fighting for the same thing which is mean we need to 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 work together to 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 have uh, plans that can build climate change resilience and, and help the others to understand what are the threats that we are facing now. Thank you. Christian, th thank you so much. And thank you for the reminder in particular about the other kinds of conflict and the other kinds of insecurity, yeah. which are also linked very closely to the impact of climate change, the crim organized crime and criminal violence mm -hmm. and stuff. So now I turn to Rosemary De Carlo, Under Secretary General of the United Nations. And I mean, as I said at the beginning, the security related impact of climate change is increasing and it's becoming more visible. So how is the how is your work? How is the work of the UN developing in, in response to the growing threat and the growing awareness of the, of the problem? Well, thank, thank you very much, Dan. Let me just start out, though, with two more statistics, if I may. 70% uh, of the most climate vulnerable countries are among the most fragile. Uh, 15 countries that are considered most susceptible to climate change are home to UN peacekeeping operations, special political missions. So it became very apparent that the UN had to really change out of necessity how it approaches maintaining peace and security. Uh, and take into uh, account uh, climate change. Um, you, Minister Lin mentioned the climate security mechanism. 
Uh, and I wanna thank Sweden for its support for the establishment of this mechanism and Dan, you for all of your efforts in helping us get it launched. Uh, what is it? Uh, it's a mechanism that includes four departments uh, from the UN, my department, political and peace building, um, the Department of Peace Operations, that is the peacekeeping department, uh, the in UN Environment Program and the UN Development Program. We're working together initially on analysis. We needed to understand what the impact was. We just didn't have that information at our fingertips, right? Uh, then moving to what do we do about it? Um, and we've managed to assemble quite a bit of information about the impact of climate change around the world. We've done some interesting uh, things with countries. The, the goal is to advise countries on dealing with these risks uh, and also our field missions. Um, we've worked, for example, on uh, with Iraq on satellite imagery um, that can help uh, hit, identify the hotspots and worked with the government in trying to address them. Uh, certainly, we've worked a lot with Somalia where we have a major mission uh, on uh, dealing with scarce resources because of um, droughts and floods uh, and worked on intercommunal tensions there. Um, we then decided that we couldn't do all of this from headquarters. We had to send people to the field. So we are embedding climate security advisors now in some of our missions. We already have them in Somalia, South Sudan, our office in the Horn of Africa, our office in Central Africa. Next on our list is the office in uh, West Africa and Iraq. Uh, with additional funding, we could do a lot more uh, and it is needed. Um, we also realized in, in our analysis that we had to be, be a bit broader and not just look at climate, but we had to look at the intersection between various issues that we were uh, investigating. For example, gender. Uh, and then it sort of, we realized, okay, women predominate in food production, over 50% uh, in developing countries. They own only 10% of the land. Um, we realized that it was uh, clear that um, their women's capacity to address uh, climate problems really has not been fully explored. So we're working a lot now with our gender unit on also addressing this issue among various women's groups around the world. The, um, we feel very strongly uh, that we have to invest more and our peace building fund is investing considerably now in projects dealing with climate security. We've thus far um, expended $85 million. That is not a lot of money given the needs but it is a significant share of the fund. So I would join others who say we need a lot more resources in order to deal with not only better analysis, but better implementation. Rosemary, thank you so much. And I think also, you know, just as Christian brought crime uh, into the picture, it's really important to understand the importance of inclusivity and the gender uh, aspect of that, and also then the other dimensions of inclusivity and climate action. Now, as everybody knows, this is a week when there are so many things to do that nobody has any time to do anything properly, all right? <laughs> so the challenge before everyone, because I, I want to, my ambition is that we finish the meeting at the time stated, even though we began a little bit later. This gives us a quarter of an hour which means two minutes per head to be answering my next question. And that means I'm going to turn rude at two minutes and you'll hear that. I'm using the, uh, instead of using the very soft um, um, IPI pen, I'm using my own Cipri pen because it carries more authority. <laughs> so resources are not finite. There are many calls upon them. Time is short. What should be the priorities? Uh, Nizreen, over to you. What matters most to you at this moment? To stay alive. <laughs> um, well, first, to be fast, and uh, you, you must understand my fast language speaking. <laughs> I just um, I want to share that I am very proud to share the panel with uh, Amina because, first of all, she's young and she's a minister. And um, from what she mentioned, I think we should, I should start uh, crowdfunding for my trip to Maldives before it disappeared. So please be generous in your donations <laughs> and take me to Maldives. Um, and secondly, 
I think Latin America uh, is going to be a very good um, weight when it comes to climate action and climate movement. We have um, the very nice change in Chile, then followed by Colombia. Costa Rica is already championing and crossing fingers for Brazil. So I think we are very much um, um, looking at the, the Latin American continent. Um, regarding the resolutions that was voted, I think um, it will happen. Uh, very soon. So please, um, Minister, don't give up and continue uh, because uh, water um, break the sand, uh, the stones by uh, trying and trying and trying. Um, today, the SG, the Secretary General, uh, in his mes message said polluters must pay. And as um, um, especially in Roy John Kerry mentioned, please do it for development and climate resilience building. Otherwise, it will be useless. Uh, my final two remarks uh, are, we did a study in Sudan in 2018, and uh, 7,000 young people from Sudan participated in that. Unfortunately, from this 7,048, no, 84, 84% 84 said that they will cross the Mediterranean to Europe, even if they know there is 90% chance that they will drought in the Mediterranean. Uh, for me, this is not a, a migration disaster because we all know that we will have a climate migrant someday. But it means this is a suicidal behavior because if someone knows that there is 90% chance that they will not make it to the other side and they still want to do it, then they really lost hope. Um, and I don't blame them because 70% of them already depend on either agriculture or pastoralism that they cannot do anymore and they don't have a good education to do any other jobs so um, numbers never lie. And I'm sure if we had bigger audience, then we will have um, even more shocking uh, numbers. Um, thank you. It's, it's tough to do it when you're making such a point. So I therefore held off. That was a really powerful thing to be thinking about. And funding is one thing. Cooperation is another. Both are needed. The political, geopolitical environment is perhaps not uh, the best, shall we say. What, it, what are you hoping for? What, what could we maybe see, for example, in the new agenda for peace or in, in developments as we move forward? Well, uh, I think we should use the new agenda for peace uh, to send a signal to all the uh, UN uh, agencies and organizations that they need to further step up uh, their engagement and their cooperation on the ground. Uh, risk ma management, sustaining peace and development, and uh, to get those issues to go hand in hand. And uh, I mean, the, the Secretary General, he called and he did it again today that the whole world should be covered with an early warning, warning system within five years. Uh, and this needs to happen, uh, and the data need to be be available to 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 UN because just like Rosemary said that we don't have enough data and and uh, we could do so much more uh, not least with uh, within the mechanism environmental mechanism if we have more funding uh, I think that UN missions need to report systematically uh, on climate and security and we also need to make sure that there is personnel who can do the job. <laughs> they, this need to have more training. Uh, there are not, not enough who have the knowledge about these issues. We have uh, something called the Folkebama.academy in Sweden where we can help with this. And uh, as I said before, the climate security mechanism must be scaled up. Uh, in need to be integrated in the UN system. So those of you online, uh, I know many of you in the, in the, in the hall, you're already uh, members, but those of you who listen online, please join and give some money to this because this can really do a difference. Thank you. Um, thank you, thank you so much. And so John, over to you, you've already signaled um, that you, know, you were in Senegal, um, what further messages are you bringing about what's needed? Well, we got to make Toronto safe a success, and we've got to maximize our efforts to uh, get people to understand the upsides of this transition. It should not scare us. We should embrace it. It is filled with economic opportunity. Uh, it's the greatest economic marketplace and greatest transformation awaiting us since the Industrial Revolution, literally. And if we will get about the business of actually funding it and dealing with it, uh, we win. We win. 
the president, President Biden, has put together a program called Prepare. It's an all-of-government effort to provide uh, uh, provide emergency capacity for adaptation and resilience. Uh, Twelve billion dollars over the next three years. Three billion in the budget for this year. That's a that's a start. But no one will pretend that that's sufficient. What we really need to do is, and we're going to try and do this in the next couple of weeks, and we'll, we'll see whether we can put this out there in the course of our pre-cop and then, and then the trouble shake. We have to come up with a new financing mechanism. We have to get the MDBs completely retooled for modern times. We have to be willing to take risk. We can't de-risk everything in this field, but we can de-risk. A lot of talk about blended finance. Nobody's really put it together, uh, but we're going to need some effort to de-risk for the trillions of dollars that are literally there to be invested in this transition. It's not giveaway. It's not concessionary. It's an investment, which means we have to create bankable projects. Many of these projects should be water, transportation, energy are all revenue producing. Where you have revenue production, you have a revenue stream that can go to the marketplace and finance. So that's we've got to coordinate that. And we're taking it on ourselves to try to help do that and produce uh, something that could really excite this transformation. Uh, the bill that the president succeeded in getting done, the Inflation Reduction Act, which has not much to do with reducing inflation, but it's a good title. Um, that bill will put tens of billions of dollars on the line for tax incentives. It's going to grow fast, the bringing to scale of new technologies, which will have a profound impact on us. So I remain optimistic. If we make the choices we, we can make, we can win this. It's, it's human nature and status quo that is our biggest enemy. And if we can resolve, we're going to go forward, we, we, we can get where we need to go. I'm really confident in that. I know we're going to get to a low income, no, a low economy, low carbon, no carbon economy. I know we are. What I can't tell you is whether we're going to get there in time to do what the scientists said, which is avoid the worst consequences of the crisis. Thank you, John Kerry. And so on to uh, Amina Shona. And again, the, the I mean, in a sense, it's a continuation of the question I was asking you beforehand. Give, give the people here, give their online audience two, three things which, you know, headlines must do. Thank you. We have 87 months uh, before we get to 2030. And what the IPCC says is, is not very good news. And I think we can do it because past couple of years, we have seen that the technology is available. We know the finance is available. We were in COVID for two, year, two and a half years, and we unlocked unprecedented amounts of money um, to help a global health crisis. We um, came up with vaccines in record time. We came up with the money, trillions of dollars were unlocked because we treated the health crisis as an emergency. And I think the reason why governments and um, institutions are still not moving is because people don't feel the urgency of this. People are not treating this as an emergency. And now we're not the only frontline state. Every one of us in this room have felt the impacts of climate change, be it um, heat waves, floods, um, food production issues, anything, we know that. So secondly, what I want to say is that um, it's very clear that the finance is available if we just look into what's happening with the war as well. Countries are coming up with finances, new ways to help other countries. So treating the climate crisis as an emergency is really important. Secondly, I want to say is that I don't want to leave the Maldives. And um, we are 500,000 people in the Maldives. Leaving the country is not an option for us. The issues that we will face with the reintegration and all these things is far more complex than what we imagine. So we still have 87 months to go. And as um, Senator Kerry said, um, I think um, we really need to come together 
and resolve the political issues around it. It's not the technology, it's not the finance, it's a political problem. And um, we need to make climate change an election issue in every single country. Thank you so much. And Christian, over to you. Thank you very, very quickly. I think that in terms of support, um, I'm looking on COP27 and I wish that every country will revise their NDCs and, and their commitments to, to align with the, 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 the global temperature goal and no more than 1.5. This is the first, I think, that, uh, that uh, there is a need also on, on support to, to have this, uh, um, uh, to increase the scientific and capacity building support for all the, the countries. We need the science, we need to do these decisions, these political decisions based based uh, on, on, uh, on science, and we need the support of the countries on that. In, the, in, in funding, for sure, we need to, to the, the structure of the cooperation, but on also the financing for, for the fight against climate change, we need to, to revise, but to, we don't have time but we need to be creative and we need to talk about that constantly. And I think that uh, in this table, that we have also some allies regarding the G20 also to raise those issues there because time is running and we need to go. And, and in terms of cooperation, I think, uh, and I repeat that the, 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 the transfer of technology is fundamental for our countries to be sure that we can manage the situation to have adaptability and, and to decrease our vulnerabilities. And thank you very much. Thank you, Christian. And uh, Rosemary, I'm going to have the final word. So over to you for the not quite final word. <laughs> thank you very much. Well, first and foremost, I think we need to ensure that dealing with climate risk is embedded in our conflict prevention efforts. It has to be very clear. Uh, in addition to needing you know, better data on risks and good practices, I would say we need to focus a lot more on um, local knowledge and factor that into our efforts. Uh, and we also need greater connections between local regional um, entities, local national and regional entities, I would say. Um, there should be no borders here. So here is what I take away from what I think has been a tremendous panel. I know I've rushed you in the last few minutes, but I think it really has been a rich discussion. There is an enormous opportunity waiting for us. Of course, there are big dangers, but there is a huge opportunity waiting for us. How do we manage to take advantage of that opportunity? Sort out the knowledge both in terms of the knowledge itself, the training of people, the institutions which can use and distribute and handle the knowledge. Sort the financing. It hasn't been mentioned, but you know, it would be an idea to stop subsidizing fossil fuel production so much. It's, it's well over half a billion dollars a year in direct subsidies, and it's an estimated at over 5 trillion in indirect subsidies to the fossil fuel industry. Don't let anybody tell me there are not enough financial resources to do this. So sort the knowledge, sort the financing, make the technological transfers, integrate the peace and the uh, environmental, the climate agendas together, and ensure that the action is all of society. It must be inclusive. It's not just about gender inclusive, about including marginalized people, including indigenous people, including uh, across class boundaries, across all boundaries, all of social society mobilization. So thank you very much, everybody, for attending this slightly breathless meeting. <laughs> uh, I hope